we as a species are obsessive and compulsive about modeling. We seem unable to simply experience experience without imposing upon it some structure, typically linguistic and often interpretive and evaluative, far away from the actual experience itself. I suppose that language is one of the crowning achievements of our species, historically. Um, and it allowed, suppose, and again, there's <laughs> what evidence could we have for such things, uh, but suppose that uh, language, as I'm presently using it, and you're presently receiving it, started out as simply a taxonomic way of naming things that were important in the environment repetitively, like saber-toothed tigers and caves and various foodstuffs that were available for collection in the ancient days, in the primitive times of our ancestors. And I propose that there was a, a strange and quite amusing magic moment that occurred probably repetitively in our species, far beyond the reach that we have of any historical record. And that was a, a, a moment when we had Orc and Gork, two cavemen. And um, they wander out of their cave in the bright, into the bright sunshine of the morning. And there's a catchment basin, basin where they capture rainwater for purposes of drinking and washing and so forth. And Orc walks up to it and, uh, uh, I drink water, essentially identifying self, uh, an action verb, drink, and a particularly appropriate object to drink water. And as uh, Orc moves away, Gork moves up to sort of repeat the ritual, the morning ritual. And in his peripheral vision, he catches sight of a saber-toothed tiger that's lurking behind a nearby feature, a large rock, very large rock, because they were very large creatures. And as he begins to speak, before he catches sight of the saber-toothed tiger, he manages, I drink. He catches sight of the saber-toothed tiger. And immediately, because of survival instincts, goes through an internal computation Where's the closest rock I could use to begin to drive this creature away and save myself and my colleagues and the band that's hiding still in the cave? And so the word rock comes to mind. So he, he utters the, the sentence, I drink, momentary interruption, rock. Now, suppose that Orc and Gork survive this particular encounter. And later on that evening, Orc is saying, uh, uh. Gork say, I drink rock. <laughs> and everybody starts to laugh. That's a magic moment. Moving from an accounting system, the language has, for these people at least, for the first time, freed itself of the constraints of simply registering what is in fact available at the sensory level. So rather than being a, a accounting system, which simply had a one-to-one -one mapping between important features of the environment and the, the words of the language itself, the sound sequences of the language itself. In this special moment, that bonding, that tight mapping one-to-one -one between these objects in the environment of importance and the language is ruptured. And now in the internal representations of that group of people who heard this strange utterance, I drink rock, is a new possibility that is, language now has a generative force. And things which have never been experienced, things which have never been thought of before, suddenly become available by this mechanism called language, which generates possibilities which are not simply registering the experiences and objects of the immediate environment, but rather are promoting possible worlds, worlds which have not yet been achieved by this band of proto-humans. Now we fly in 747s transatlantically. Where did that come from? Oh, I'm sure it came from some strange manipulation of language where an identification with a bird was so intense that people began to talk as if they might themselves achieve such things. And so in this th sense, historically, I think language, freeing itself of the tyranny of this tight mapping between experience and the actual language itself. It was an extreme, that was an extremely important moment, this so-called magic moment I'm referring to. 
I don't think we have that problem. I think we have the opposite problem. And Carmen and John's work uh, with the practitioners, especially yesterday, in terms of sensory acuity, bringing you back to refining your sensory apparatus to be able to appreciate what, in fact, is happening around you. I think the primary problem we face as modern, up to this point, human beings, is the inverse of this magic moment, to get reconnected with the sensory richness of life. And so a great deal of what we're going to be doing is insisting on constantly upgrading your calibration skills. And in particular, the most important set of calibrations you'll ever make are self-calibrations. Here we have a ball. Who's, we got an engineer? Engineers? We have, thank you, one, two, okay. I'll, I'll take you, sir. So we have our engineer here. There's a ball here. Um, I asked the engineer to come forward and make the measurements necessary to make a prediction about where the ball will come to rest after I deliver a kick. So he measures things like the mass or weight of the ball, coefficient of friction between the carpet and the surface of the ball, um, the direction and uh, kinetic energy uh, in the force that I deliver with a kick, loss of energy because of friction between my shoe and the ball. He makes many, many such measurements, all of them known for what, 300 years in, in Western traditions anyway. And at the end of it, he'll plug all these values into a set of formulas, and he will tell us with arbitrary precision where the ball will come to rest. Everybody happy with this? This is not a particularly taxing thing. It's a well-known set of operations. Now we repeat the experiment, and we change only one thing, namely the object. We replace the ball with an object of equal mass or weight, a cat. And we repeat the experiment. No matter how many measurements this gentleman makes, what will be the prediction? There is no prediction. The laws that apply to mechanical non-living systems are not the same laws that apply to the interaction of biological living systems. And if you forget that, you've missed the single most important point at the level of epistemology you could get out of what we do. But we are made fools of by language on a daily basis. How many people have ever said something like, my teenager really makes me angry when they don't come home on time? Or my spouse, when he or she fails to respond to a question I make, irritates the hell out of me. Examine those two sentences. Makes me, what was it? The teenager? Makes me what? Angry. What? Angry. angry. Makes me angry. Notice the structure of my teenager makes me angry. There's an agent, teenager. There's a causative verb, a description of a change of state, angry, and the identification of who it occurs in. This is cause effect. This is kicking the ball. If I don't touch you, there is nothing I can do to make you feel anything. Anything. Can you insult me? You, can you insult me? Or you could try. That's exactly right. And try, with its usual implications of failure, is the correct verb for him to select. Unless I'm willing to participate in this, you can't insult me. How could words change feelings? This is insanity. It's an insanity that's extremely common in our species. And it's the source of most of the things you're going to initially change in your own life to free yourself. Let's say it this way. Your job in self-application and application to others is to convert people from balls into cats. That's it. That's the program. The only justification for the application of NLP patterns is the creation of choice in precisely those sets of contexts in which choice presently does not exist. Full stop.